Welcome, welcome um, uh, to this panel. Thank you, first of all, for attending this morning's career in European Union law. Um, this is uh, the famous ENE, the European uh, the Employment Network event of the Hague University of Applied Sciences. It's, uh, it's an event which is a, a great opportunity to connect um, between the students, but also between the professionals, of course, and therefore between the current and future actors of the European uh, scene. And um, this morning's panel is going to be moderated by Dr. Kostyokovic and by myself, Lucie Placero, who have the pleasure to welcome three wonderful speakers. Um, we have Dr. Mihai Vatsov with us, Plamena Varkova and Vesela Stoilova. Um, this panel will last approximately until 10.30, giving each speaker around 30 minutes uh, to share their experience and answer the question from the audience. Um, once again, thank you to our guests for being with us and for giving their time for these events. And thank you to our uh, audience too, who can, I want to remind it, participate live by asking questions directly in the chat. Um, your question will actually be uh, read with the precious help of Astrid Ayo Weiss that I can uh, see uh, here as well. So to begin, I would like to give the floor to my colleague first, uh, Dr. Kostyovkovic, who will introduce our first speaker. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you can all uh, hear me. Um, sorry, right now I'm fixing the camera and we don't want to take too much time with that. So sorry for this inconvenience. Um, first of all, welcome everyone. We are very glad to have you all here. We appreciate the time you um, decided to devote for this event and our students definitely um, also uh, feel the same. And uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speak speaker, uh, Dr. Mikhail Vatso. Uh, he is a graduate of TUAS, of the law program in 2013. Uh, and um, I would like to give the floor to him that he would uh, talk a bit more about his career path. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm really glad to be able to join you for a little while. I'll have to leave at uh, around 9.20 because, uh, you know, work starts. Um, first of all, I guess, uh, hello from uh, sunny Brussels, as you can see uh, on, on my back. Uh, I have this uh, Brussels landscape behind me. Um, I'm... Uh, uh, so yeah, I graduated in 2013 from The Hague, and then I went to Maastricht for my first master's. Uh, then I went to the European University Institute in Florence for a research master, and then I jumped to Edinburgh to do my uh, PhD. So more or less, this was my uh, academic uh, development for several years after, uh, after The Hague. Um, during my uh, during my master degrees, I have been I started researching uh, the area of uh, EU fisheries law. So I uh, continued with that with my PhD, which focused on the EU's external uh, action in the area of fisheries, uh, which led me to my professional development in the area of fisheries. So. I was a Blue Book stagiaire uh, in 2019 uh, in Brussels, in Digimare. And then uh, I moved to, to Bulgaria, back, uh, back home. I joined the Bulgarian Ministry of Agriculture, uh, again, working in the area of fisheries. And while in Bulgaria, then at, at some point, I joined uh, the Bulgarian sub-regional office of the General Fisheries Commission of the Mediterranean, which is a body of FAO, with, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization. So I continued with fisheries. And that was up until this spring uh, when uh, I, I left the, the GFCM. And since the beginning of, month, of, of this month of May, 
uh, I joined the, the European Commission. But uh, as a standard disclaimer, nothing I say can be attributed to the European Commission. So this is more or less uh, uh, my, my path briefly. And I think it would be more interesting if I uh, gather some questions for the rest of, the, of my stay for the next 15 minutes uh, for, from the students, whoever is interested in uh, my story. Uh, many thanks for this introduction. Indeed, you had a very interesting and rich uh, career path. Um, and I perhaps will start uh, the questions and then our students will, of course, follow on. Um, perhaps you can elaborate a bit more uh, on actually what skills you uh, found the most useful that you got here at TUAS and then in your uh, further career, what did you actually like need most uh, and yeah what was the most actually yeah, useful ones that you learned here at was um the skills well the research skills obviously helped a lot um also uh because the the master in florence was a research master and then for the phd so research skills they helped a lot and i developed them uh largely during my uh participations in the moot court competitions that uh, uh we had at the hague so there i i was part of a telders team and then the ulo moot court so that helped a lot um the the internship that i did during my uh studies in the hague uh the, the main part of the internship was at the OPCW, so that helped a lot with uh, being in this uh, international setting uh, to, to be able to know how to relate to the, in this case, with member state representatives, uh, uh, other colleagues uh, that are uh, working in an international setting. So these kind of things really prepare you. So the research on the academic side uh, being able to find the proper information to critically analyze uh, whatever you have found and then to be able to uh, develop your multicultural communication skills to basically know how to act in international setting. This, is, uh, this has proven very important uh, and it is a sought after um, quality and skill. If you look at a lot of the job vacancies, uh they would have most of the time now they have an explicit uh point in that you know experience in multicultural setting and this is i think uh, one of the very important things that the suas gives mm -hmm. thank you very much um, and I would like to ask our student assistant or uh, yeah, any students who are present perhaps uh, to uh, ask your questions or if there are questions in the chat, um, please let us know. I would like to give the floor, the opportunity to students to ask questions. Um, hi, yes, good morning. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, in the chat just yet, uh, but I wanted to ask um, which uh, internships would you recommend in, within the area of EU law, which wouldn't necessarily be starting a traineeship in one of the European institutions? Can, can you repeat that, that last part of the question? Um, yes, uh, an internship that wouldn't um, be in starting a traineeship in one of the European institutions, because I know that you can only do that once. And for example, for us, we need to do the, the, the internship uh, during the bachelor's. So ideally, uh, another internship that wouldn't require us to go to Brussels and then have to come back to, to finish our degree. Uh -huh. So what else other than uh, the EU institutions? Well, first of all, I don't think that the uh, the Blue Book traineeships or first of all, the, the internships or the traineeships at the so-called EU institutions, uh, most of them are Blue Book mm -hmm. traineeships, but not all of them. So uh, and if, if uh, the students don't know, but uh, in The Hague, uh, we are quite lucky because there are certain uh, EU agencies in The Hague 
that uh, have um, uh, that have traineeship positions that are not connected to the blue book system. Uh, so, and there have been a lot of uh, uh, there have been students from when I was back in the two us that uh, that did that uh, in in Eurojust. Uh, so. It, it you don't burn your your chances i mean if you explore the the small uh the small print of uh, the blue books uh, rules and when you can apply and when you cannot uh, that can be useful and furthermore uh, i don't think that uh, first of all it would be very hard for you to get into a blue book traineeship while uh while you are studying your bachelor your degree that's one thing. Um, another thing would be, even if you get it, uh, that doesn't mean that you burn your options. So, but other than that, just to answer your question, uh, I don't know. In 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 the Hague, you have um, you have the embassies. You have the embassies, which uh, provide a lot of useful opportunities. Uh, uh, what I and also the the embassies in Brussels, you know, the your embassy in Brussels, you you allows you to still deal with uh, EU law issues. So I guess that can be an option other than the agencies uh, in the Hague. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for the question and uh, the answer, of course. Um, I would like to ask um, whether there are any other questions by the audience, um, because yeah, we don't want to <laughs> keep our speaker for too long. So we need to use this time optimally. Maybe I can ask a question, even if I'm a speaker and not a student, but because uh, your career path is very interesting and you mentioned the European University Institute, but for a research master. And I was wondering why didn't you choose it for a PhD because um, I, I did a summer school there and it's such a wonderful institution. And I was wondering why did you choose Edinburgh and not uh, your EUI for, for a PhD? I think this would be very beneficial also for the students who want to continue with, uh, with academic career maybe. Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question in the sense that uh, I did try to then uh, stay for, for the PhD, but it was a very pe uh, peculiar moment because at that time it was, Bulgaria uh, has not yet joined the EUI and uh, the EUI as an institution is an international organization. It's not the uh, Italian university of sorts. Uh, so you need to have uh, your country of nationality being a member. And the year that I was there doing my research master, uh, Bulgaria was in the process of joining the EUI, uh, but a very long story short, uh, it did not complete the uh, all of the practicalities, let's call them like that, of joining the EUI. And uh, after that, I had already be begun my PhD and didn't make sense for me to start trying to move back uh, you know back and forth so it's not something that i did not try it's uh, something that uh, my nationality uh, let me down thank you uh, yes indeed sometimes there are of course different um, rules for, for people coming from different countries and uh, that, of course, can play a role in, in the career path, but still, yeah, it's uh, the most important is that, uh, well, at the end, everything worked pretty well. And even though, like, uh, yes, with, uh, like, even, even if you have some obstacles, I think that also something for our students, this uh, should not yeah, let you down. You can try elsewhere and, of course, succeed. Um, I would like to ask just uh, because we are on, on this topic a little bit and perhaps you have some also um, yeah, advice and tips you can give to students like to share um, that uh, with regards to how you how you 
overcame some obstacles in your uh, at the beginning of your career path because our uh, students, of course, in a couple of years or in a year, will be starting their career and, of course, will have yeah, different obstacles. So can you describe perhaps what you had to deal with and perhaps give some yeah, advice how to uh, overcome those obstacles? Thank you. Mm. Uh, obstacles, I mean, nothing comes easy, obviously, and most of the obstacles, the general obstacles that uh, one would have in the beginning of the career is uh, getting rejections, obviously. Um, so the main solution to getting rejections is uh, apply to more places and continue applying to that place if that's the place you want to go continuously, basically. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, and in the meantime, obviously try to improve yourself. So uh, when I was uh, finishing The Hague and when I was applying for the master's, uh, you know, the master's degree, I did not apply just to Maastricht, obviously. I applied to several places uh, and I, at that time, I wanted to go to the EUI. So I also applied uh, to the EUI directly after The Hague. Um, I didn't get it. So uh, then I was accepted in Maastricht and uh, in Stockholm, I think, and in Lisbon. Uh, those three I was accepted. I was rejected from a few other places, obviously, uh, and we have to deal with the rejections. And from those three, the question was, which of those three would make it easier for me to then actually go to the EUI? So, and after consulting with my professors, uh, it came up to me that uh, Maastricht was the, the best way because uh, they also had a good uh, research reputation and uh, uh, there are certain professors that were uh, teaching both at the EUI and Maastricht. So I had the opportunity to prove myself in front of them, uh, which may or may not have helped. But in the end of the day, I did uh, apply again to the EUI after uh, Maastricht and I got it. So if you fail, then you know you get up, uh, you better yourself and you try again if you think that this is what you want. Uh, uh, with, the, with the PhD situation then, you know, as I said, uh, I applied, I didn't get it the first year. Then I went to Edinburgh, but uh, you know, PhDs are uh, several years endeavors. Uh, first, you don't repeat them if uh, you are sane. And second, uh, it's not good to just switch halfway. So uh, at some point you just, uh, you know, cut your losses, accept your situation and you try to make the best out of uh, what you have. I mean, there is no right path. Everyone builds their path. And uh, then after your, uh, uh, after your education, they'll probably ask for your degrees at the first job. But then after that, uh, people just want to know that you have a degree and they look at your last job, uh, your last uh, work experience, if you are going into the, the more practical and not academic uh, sphere. So, you know, in the beginning, uh, education is important, but it's not that if you don't get in that one specific place for that one specific degree that uh, that's it, you just uh, move on. There is no point in uh, living in the past and what could have been. Thank you very much. I think it's all also very useful and uh, yeah, to know and to share this experience. I know that, um, well, you need to go, but we just received a message in the chat. So if you can just dedicate one minute uh, to answer it, um, I will read it out loud. Uh, good morning. I would like to ask you about your current position. What was in uh, is, uh, what was the admission process, and what do you think was your biggest advantage against other candidates? Thank you. Um, okay, so about my current position, I cannot really talk a lot. Uh, I can only say uh, now that I'm in uh, DG Agri, so I moved from the fisheries area. I went to uh, agriculture now, so that's uh, one thing I can say. Uh, I'm a, um, I did not enter as an administrator, but as a contract agent uh, to those interested that uh, they know what that means. And the process is, I mean, it's too long for me to explain it now. There is uh, a lot of information online 
about this process, but any process of getting you to the institutions includes uh, sitting exams. Uh, a lot of um, the, you know, this type of um, numerical reasoning, verbal reasoning, etc. Uh, exams, the EPSO, so-called EPSO exams, uh, or the concours for the AD officials. And uh, my biggest advantage, um, well, first of all, for, for the cast, as I said, you need to have passed the exam. And even in that situation, I have, uh, I have tried before for uh, similar contract agent positions. So I've sat the exams several times. Uh, the first time I failed, but I saw what the exam is about. And the second time, because the exam is uh, two prone, it has one part, uh, that is more general, and then you have uh, a specific part, competency part. So the second time I passed the general part, but I failed the competency part. Then the third time I uh, passed both uh, both parts, and uh, having passed the exam, and when this uh, vacancy appeared and they were looking for someone uh, a little bit quicker, uh, I guess this may have helped because they didn't have uh, they. Uh, yeah, I didn't have to wait for me to actually sit an exam and uh, have the risk, uh, run the risk of me failing that exam. So uh, again, uh, what I've said before, just trying and uh, trying again, trying better, you know, even if you fail, you stand up and you continue and that may have helped. And also the, um, even if the current work area of work is agriculture and I used to be in fisheries and they're not that related, although they are, uh, in a sense, because they're both under the uh, chapeau of the agriculture uh, policy in a way, in a very general way. Uh, my, some of my skills from uh, and experiences in the area of fisheries could have been and could be um, translated in, the, in agriculture. So I guess they did not find like the perfect agriculture related professional so i was the next best best fit so the important thing is to be able to show how you can um, translate your current uh, knowledge and experience to the new position during the interview if you get lucky to get uh, invited to the interview so uh, that's what uh, i think my biggest advantage was uh, i mean i don't know what are the other candidates what, what were the other candidates but uh, I just tried, tried again and uh, showed why I think uh, would be very good for the place. And uh, I guess they agreed. Right, um, thank you so much. And uh, especially like for sharing the story and for encouraging our students to try and to go for their dreams. Um, I don't want to keep you longer. We know that you have to, uh, now to, uh, you have to leave already now. So um, again, we thank you a lot for your time that you dedicated uh, to this uh, meeting today. And uh, well, we wish you uh, all the best. Uh, have a nice day today. And overall, um, wishing you all the best in your further career and hoping to see you very soon in our uh, events at TUA. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, have a nice event. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. I would now like to um, welcome uh, Flamena Markova. Thank you very much for agreeing to participate in this uh, in this e, e We are honored to have you with us today. Um, we know that you are currently working at the European Parliament after various experiences uh, in European and national agencies and institutions. So. Can you perhaps tell us a bit more about you and your backgrounds? How, um, how did you get there? All right. Thank you, firstly, for inviting me. It's uh, such a nice, uh, uh, such, a, such a great event and so nice to, to be able to talk to students. And I remember how I was enjoying the uni when I was in the, in the Hague University. So thank you very much. I will be try. Uh, I will try to be quick so that you know there are more more time for questions as Mikhail did. Um, I also did my bachelor at the Hague University, and um, I was specializing in European law. And um, I managed to do uh, an Erasmus exchange in Rome again, specializing in, in European law at the Luis Guido Carli. Then I did my 
Master of Law at King's College in London. Um, I knew that, that I want to continue in London, so I was accepted in a couple of um, uh, some of the top universities there, UCL, LSC, uh, King's College and Queen Mary University, and I chose King's. And uh, um, of course, I did several internships during uh, my um, four years at the Hague University. And um, after London, I was applying for the EU institutions. It was my dream to, to come here and uh, to work here. And um, I started as a trainee. Uh, I was an MEP trainee. Um, now I work as an um, uh, as a, uh, advisor of uh, one member of the European Parliament. So uh, I would say that I was lucky because there was an open position in 15. So after my um, uh, trainee uh, traineeship, he invited me uh, to stay for uh, for the whole uh, mandate, and um, it was a lot of hard work. But this is how I landed here. Um, I of course I need to make the same disclaimer as uh, Mikhail did that uh, everything I am saying today is uh, just on my personal behalf and not on behalf of my boss or on behalf of the European Parliament because I have a contract with the European Parliament. And um, I am open to any questions. Maybe this will make the discussion more lively. So if you would like to ask me, um, I'm uh, open to talk about anything. Uh, it will be interesting for the students. Thank you very much. I will just give a, a bit of time for the students perhaps to to write down their their questions. In the meantime, I'm going to I'm going to start with the with the first one was uh, related to the, tra the 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 switch from trainees to uh, contractual. How was uh, you were mentioning so there was this uh, this transition. How was the transition between uh, both in terms of tasks? What what changed uh, in um, well, firstly, to start with the procedure, maybe it would be uh, beneficial to say that um, um, the European Parliament has a couple of types of traineeships, and you can be an MEP trainee or you can go with the Schumann traineeship. And um, the advantage of being a, a trainee for an MEP it has just a very regular uh, application procedure. You need to send your uh, CV, your motivation letter. You have a couple of interviews. It depends on the office of the MEP how um, they want to test you. I, in the beginning, I had a two-month uh, um, probation period, for example. And um, then um, it is not um, um, uh, the procedure is not the same as in the Commission. Um, if you work for an MEP, for a member of the European Parliament, it depends on him whether he wants to, to take you um, a, as part of his team and it depends on the uh, different um, committees he's participating in and the different work that he's doing. You don't need to do uh, uh, an EPSO or a CAF test, but of course, if you do those, you would have more benefits in like um, you there are higher chances that you're taken on board but this is not a, a very restrictive condition if you want to work for an MEP specifically and the same is for a political party if you were um, a, a student and a member of the young members of a certain political party and then you want to continue in the parliament there are often a lot of uh, uh, open positions for for um, for um, trainees at the political parties and then uh, they could offer you um, a position at the, at the party and um, this is also another way to, to enter the institution. Uh, uh, in terms of tasks, well, um, it again depends on the way the member of the European Parliament works because uh, I was lucky enough that uh, from the very beginning my member was uh, giving uh, me a lot of um, important tasks because he said that he doesn't want uh, the trainees in his office to feel left out and we're not there to make coffee and to print documents, we're there to see how the European Parliament works. And since I have been studying European law for so many years, it, it really was uh, very interesting for me. And I was working hard. I was staying late every night. And I think this was very important afterwards uh, to, to, to give me the position of, uh, of an advisor in this team. And um, of course, now I have a lot more responsibility, but um, it really depends on, on the member. I personally was following uh, this member of the European Parliament since I was a student and uh, it's um, a young Bulgarian member. He's really, really ambitious and uh, I'm really happy to, to work for him because I wanted to work also for my home country in a way, even if uh, from Brussels. 
thank you really uh, yeah really interesting and uh, also it's uh, it's nice to see the connection as well with the the home country while being in 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 the in the european union institution so that's i think a good uh, also good thing to to keep in mind um is there any questions perhaps either on the chat or if you want to take the floor um uh, addressing here to the students Or to Astrid, is there any questions? Um, hi. Um, yeah. Once again, I don't see any chats in, in any questions in the chat yet, but I actually had a question. <laughs> um, hi. Good morning. I wanted to ask if you would consider it a, a significant advantage or disadvantage to have the same or a different nationality than an MEP that you work for. Um, of course, it's an advantage. It's an advantage, firstly, in terms of the language, because a lot of the members of the European Parliament prefer to uh, be, prefer their um, uh, workers to, of course, speak the language of the uh, country of origin. In my case, it's Bulgaria, but I would say that if you speak um, a number of uh, European languages, and especially French, German, and of course English, you have higher chances to be taken in uh, different offices. And uh, if you can speak French and German, a German MEP can also take you. It's, uh, it's a bit more difficult maybe for, let's say, um, uh, Croatia or, uh, you know, for a smaller countries that you really need to, to speak the, the language of the country. But I would say that, for example, for Germany, I have seen some people that are not from Germany and I have colleagues that uh, are not from Germany, but they work for German MEP. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So it would be more about language than rather than nationality. Um, languages are extremely important indeed. Um, um, the nationality matters when uh, um, you need to also be um, uh, aware of what is happening in the country, like the political situation in the country, because this is a very political type of job and uh, you work for a party. Uh, so I would say that this is why the nationality matters, but if you can speak the language of the country, then you can read the news in that country and you can read communication, invitations, uh, press releases, you can prepare interviews, so uh, language and country are both important. Okay, thank you so much. I see another question in the chat, if uh, that's okay, I can uh, just read it. Uh, good morning, Ms. Markova. What do you do on a daily basis in your position as an advisor for an MEP? Do you focus on a specific area of EU law or is your focus more general? And what legal or non-legal skills do you need on a daily basis in your job? Uh, thanks so much for the question. Well, um, um, uh, an advisor of a map does a lot, a lot of things uh, in different fields, but I personally uh, am uh, responsible for the committee on uh, budgetary control and budget because uh, my member is participating in uh, four committees and two delegations and uh, I am um, my main, main area of responsibility is budgetary control and then I'm also assisting in the budget committee. Um, I um, of course need to apply my EU law skills every, every day because this is um, uh, one of the co-legislators of the European Union so um, it's very important that when you have to prepare for a plenary session, when you have to read legislation, when you have to work on amendments for your boss, when you have to prepare different type of reports and uh, his participation, I would say that it's very helpful that I studied law. Of course, this is not obligatory. There are a lot of people here that have studied uh, uh, political science or uh, European policy, and uh, they are still uh, uh, having the same job position as me. But I would say that for me, my personal advantage was that I actually studied EU law for, for many years, and uh, I feel um, better prepared because a lot of times we have to work on uh, topics that are not uh, uh, in our main responsibility. For example, when we prepare the plenary session, when the members of the European Parliament have to vote on different files every month, and then there are a variety of topics, including environmental topics or um, international law, constitutional law, and you have to really be able, when you read a, a different piece of legislation, you have to be able to understand what's there. So um, um, I would say that um, it's quite general. 
and about the legal or non-legal skills on a daily basis in, in your job. I mean, it's, it's really not obligatory that you have legal skills, but if you have studied law, as all of you are in the Hague University and study international and European law, I would say it's in your advantage that you, you have some legal skills, definitely. I hope I, I answered the question. It's quite a detailed question. So if there is a follow up, just uh, let me know. I I'm, I'm just going to um, yeah to, to to follow up here with the with the part which was about legal and non legal. Um, so uh, before you were saying that indeed. So in terms of legal. Uh, legal knowledge, it, it is important to study law, but it's not mandatory, uh, according to uh, what you were just saying. And in terms of non-legal skills, before you were mentioning languages, so it's important to be able to speak different languages, but um, are there some languages that are absolutely necessary, uh, no matter uh, um, where, where you are? Or, and yeah, how does it work exactly in terms of languages? Well, um, I would say that French and English and German are the most important. There are not so many people here speaking German unless they are from German nationality. But um, uh, the um, French is really important because we are also in a, a French-speaking part of Belgium. And um, you would imagine that uh, one of the official languages of this institution as the rest of the EU institutions is French as well. So I would say that if you speak French, this, is, this would be of your benefit. But of course, uh, there are all these jokes about like the bad the European English that all people in the institutions from different nationalities speak and uh, in the end of the day having a good level of English will also um, help you to go through. So um, uh, often is the case that people come here and they speak English and they start learning French and we also have uh, language courses here in the parliament so you are um, as long as you have um, uh, the time for it, you are allowed to, to learn other languages as well. All right, so there are, la there are languages, uh, courses organized by the European Parliament. Then yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of uh, courses and trainings on different topics, not only languages, but for example, research, understanding uh, legislation, financial rules, and um, everything that would be beneficial for all the people that, that work here. Okay, and so then, then that um, connects a bit with the, to the question with non-legal skills. So there are uh, non-legal skills when it comes to, of course, some knowledge of, uh, of uh, EU languages, but also um, yeah, some others related to then the, the budget, as you were saying. So um, what are the non-legal skills you would advise perhaps our students to have in order to join the, the European Parliament and also to put uh forward during i don't know an interview or uh, or in the motivation think, uh, most important are the research skills and i think the Hague university um has a, a big benefit in that because you can be also a research assistant uh, i was a research uh, assistant uh, for uh, uh one of uh, um, uh, the um, uh, professors working at the university so i think research skills is very very important to be able to um uh, dive into uh, a number of uh, sources and uh, find the most efficient and recent information academic I think is very important and uh, I believe that when we had the skills uh, there was legal writing and uh, this was very beneficial definitely I, I remember this um, and definitely networking and being able to be um, to behave yourself in a uh, as Michael said international or let's say European environment because here um, you have a lot of meetings with a lot of different people every day associations lobbyists and uh, you definitely need to, to to know how to present your interest and how to network so um, um, honestly I think that everything that we have studied in The Hague was super beneficial and exactly because it's a more practical type of uh, degree and education and especially taking the internship so I believe that the students have all the, um, the ability to work on their skills 
non-legal or even legal as well. And uh, you just need to take uh, take all the opportunities that the university gives you because it, it gives a very good preparation for sure. Thank you, thank you for your uh, your your feedback. And when it comes to your daily uh, daily work, then you are saying so. Of course, you have some reports probably to write, and you have some writing skills that are necessary. But it seems like, um, as you were mentioning, there are also connections with uh, uh, the, so the the lobby, for instance, and some discussions with uh, with other actors. So on a daily basis or on a weekly basis how how often are you perhaps behind the desk how often are you uh, um, discussing with other uh, members how does it work well um, uh, during the three years of covid it was pretty difficult to to be is anywhere else but behind the desk because um, um, all the meetings and all the life in the parliament was has stopped and uh, in the beginning when I came here um, there were so many people and you would meet uh, people for different events there would be events at least three times per week where my boss would be allowed would be invited to speak or uh, to attend then um, it depends on the um, uh, committees that he's working different associations contact us they offer their positions so we have to uh, decide whether we want to meet with them whether there's something beneficial um, to, to to make cooperation with them uh, then on the different reports that we are working for example every day I would come to the office then if there are committee meetings I would follow the committee meetings for my boss and I would accompany him to the committee rooms and give him preparation for um, the different meetings so I would have to prepare his uh, interventions in the meetings then um, if we have reports, I would have to work on his, um, um, uh, let's say, whether he, you can be a rapporteur or a shadow rapporteur of uh, reports um, in the parliament. Uh, this can be a legislative file, a non-legislative file, so I have to prepare everything that he wants to include and I have to consult with him. Then uh, I would have some meetings with an association or some calls. Then uh, he would have an interview the next morning, so I have to prepare his speaking points. So it's uh, a lot, a lot of tasks every every single day, and it really depends on what is currently happening and on the um, uh, really field of uh, the area of um, of uh, the work of the MEP. Okay, that sounds really interesting. The the, the fact that it's, yeah, really different types of tasks actually not, uh, uh, and this connects as well with um, the EU specialization or the the law, the legal specialization or not. So I guess it also explains why uh, MEPs uh, are open to uh, to allow students or uh, or young professional from the legal field, but also for the political science uh, field uh, as well. Um, and when it comes when it comes to your specializations, you were saying that you specialize in uh, in, in law uh, exclusively, right? So the, the bachelor mm -hmm. and then for your master as well. Yes, exactly. It was European law. So I was having a, a couple of uh, subjects in um, um, uh, internal market and consumer law were maybe my uh, highest uh, interest, but uh, I did um, um, uh, environmental law as well in the Hague University. Uh, in, in King's College, it was a, a little bit different the way the classes were um, um, the way I mean, the way the program was built and the classes, because there we did not uh, have to do uh, so much um, practical work, but more research. So there, I I I, did, I focused on the rule of law, and I was uh, working on uh, on uh, on the rule of law in uh, Hungary and Poland. This was my dissertation. So I did uh, quite a number of um, <laughs> number of topics indeed. And here, actually, I um, in the budgetary control committee, um, we um, have to follow the way uh, European uh, Union. Um, uh, spent uh, and member states spend the uh, EU funds, and uh, there is the rule of law um, um, uh, interlinked. So I would say that um, yeah, it it matters. Uh, but um, even if you did not have a specialization in EU law, even if you did not study law, you can still work here if you have a very specific interest in, in a specific field. And uh, um, if you can also find a, a work as an administrator in a secretariat of a committee, like say a committee for environment or for transport. So it really depends. You, If you're a specialist in a field, it's easier. This, this is what I, I, I could say. 
Okay. Thank you very much. I would like to see whether uh, some students would like to take the floor um, or if there are any questions. Um, hi, yes, uh, again, I see no more questions in the chat, but um, I had another question. Um, I wanted to ask which, um, I don't know how to say this, but uh, extracurriculars or um, practical activities that we could do while we're still uh, in through us to get us maybe one step closer to working in Brussels as well. Uh, thank you. Um, I remember that uh, while I was in the Hague University, I did uh, a lot of uh, extracurricular activities. In the beginning, I was um, volunteering for different events. So uh, there was an event uh, um, uh, connected to the Hague Peace Conference. It was in the um, um, international court and it was super interesting to see everything and to be allowed to be inside. And I was also part of ILSA, the law association for students. And also I was part of the journal for, for some time. So it, it really depends what, what uh, you, what everyone is, in, is interested uh, in. I, I was following this in the beginning. I, I um, did a mood court, but I did a mood court in Kings, but uh, the, the Hague University also provides opportunities for mood courts. I personally did not uh, do it then because I was doing the traineeship, but uh, um, I think if you do the mood court, if you volunteer, try to do some academic writing for the journal if you're interested, um, have a position in ILSA, um, just be, try to, to participate in events and to meet people and um, to expand your network. I think this is extremely important and the Hague University definitely provided this, uh, these opportunities for sure. All right, yes, perfect, thank you so much. Um... Uh, Alessandra just asked, how do I raise my hand? Uh, it's uh, by the reactions, but I think if you want, you can uh, ask the question. Yeah, I found it now, I think. Thank you. Um, so my question was, apart from your your interest in ULO, what were the main reasons that you decided to go for a position in the parliament? And, and what did, were your expectations met when you started working there? And what do you like? most about working there? Sorry, that's a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of difficult questions. But um, well, I, as I said, from the very beginning, from the very first class of you law, it was with Mr. Wilbur's. I don't know if he's still there. I don't think so. Uh, but uh, he was, uh, he actually was a very good lecturer. And uh, I really liked you law. I fell in love with you law. And then um, I was, so really, the more I learned about the European Union and the way it works, the more I would I wanted to um, work for one of the institutions. And um, when while I was in the Hague, I did um, um, one of my uh, internships at the Bulgarian Embassy and one at Eurojust, which is uh, um, an agency of the European Union that is uh, located in the Hague. And actually, for both, I was working for um, my country, for Bulgaria. So this is what motivated me after finishing my LLM uh, at uh, King's College to actually uh, apply for the parliament and apply for members of the European Parliament because I wanted specifically to work uh, for uh, one of the uh, members and I was following several of them, including my boss. But this is a very uh, personally navigated choice. So uh, I, I, I cannot say that this is the general rule of why you want to come to the, to the parliament. There are, as I said, there are a number of fields and number of opportunities. And uh, yeah, I personally follow this because this was my dream. Um, okay, and the last part of the question was, what is my favorite thing about working here? And um, well, it's really different what you imagine to be here and what it really is because um, you actually are able to see how everything works, how European legislation is created from the very first idea of it to the very final step. And um, you see how the different uh, uh, opinions of different political groups are forming a piece of legislation. And you understand that even if we study EU law and everything is very academic, once you come here, you actually see that it's extremely political. 
So uh, the way academics and uh, politics clash, you can observe here in the parliament, it's very interesting because the politicians are here, but then we have the administrators who are actually creating the law. So, um, and the politicians are influencing them. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting process. And I think this was the main difference. I did not imagine that everything works like this. Um, and um, my favorite part, I suppose, it's the fact that you can meet so many people from so many different nationalities and you can have so many opportunities and you really can change the life of citizens. And uh, for example, if my boss has uh, an idea, a project that he wants to carry out and, and help different people, I think this is important because you actually see that you make a difference for, for the life of citizens every day and you matter as a, as a worker. And that's my favorite part. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this uh, for for those answers, and I'm I'm um, I'm going to uh, follow up with uh, with another questions uh, if there is no other uh, questions from the from the audience. Um, actually, I had a, a follow up question. Um, so so sorry, um, but you uh, mentioned that you have the MEPs and then administrators writing uh, the actual laws themselves. Um, what would you consider, well, how could you explain to us a bit more the process of becoming an administrator for like actually writing the laws and the difference between um, an MEP and an administrator? Um, well, um, it is partially connected to what the previous speaker, uh, Mikhail, has said, because firstly, to become an administrator, um, you would need uh, definitely to have um, special knowledge in a certain um, topic, in a certain field. And let's say that um, the different committees that the European Parliament, as every parliament uh, um, is con 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 consisting of, are following different topics. And let's uh, take, for example, the one of uh, transport. There are different experts on transport who are working in the transport secretariat of the European Parliament. And of course, the secretariat of uh, every committee in the parliament is preparing the um, content work, the different reports, uh, the drafts of them. And of course, then um, there is a specific system according to which the different MEPs, uh, according to some points, can take a different file and of course the political groups actually so once the file is taken by the politician then he's introducing amendments or he's changing completely the text according to his point of view and then you have the voting procedures voting in committee and voting in uh, the plenary session and uh, this is how in the end it is uh, formulated and I'm skipping a very big part that um, when you do legislative files, the, the, the process is even more complicated because you need to have negotiations with the council and you have um, different trilogues, you have technical meetings in which all these um, um, uh, experts are working on the, on the law and then you have um, uh, actual uh, trilogues in which the politicians are working on it. So it's a, it's a very complicated process. But if you're interested in a topic and uh, you you uh, have experience in it, then you can uh, uh, apply to be to, to work at one of the secretariats. But for this, you definitely need the test uh, episode and, and and the cast, or you are coming from another institution, or uh, you know it really depends. You can come from uh, one of the permanent representations of the member states in the in Brussels. Um, I, I understand it sounds quite complicated, but it's very difficult to, to explain shortly. It's just uh, the, um, the way a legislation is made is a very, very, very uh, complicated process and long as well. And a lot of reports are also non-legislative. Non so the procedure is shorter for them. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, yes. That sounds uh, very, very long, but it, it, it does clear up a lot of my doubts. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you uh, for, for, for those questions and for, for this uh, answers. I'm going to um, follow up on the, on the first elements when you were mentioning the connection with, uh, with your home country and the fact that uh, 
um you of, of course you, you you are working at the uh, at the european parliament with uh, area of law related to eu law but what is the connection actually with uh, with your home country did you need some legal background from your home country or what kind of um, expectations do you think that the european parliament and the meps have when it comes to the link with the uh, with the nationality so you are you were saying you don't necessarily need to have the same nationality the language seems to be one of the most important but yeah just to uh, better understand this uh, the link Okay, well, um, indeed, the, the, I, if I have to be honest, yes, the language is not the most uh, uh, important to be taken on a job in a different team, but it is a key when you come from a country like Bulgaria, for example, because um, even if you did not study, you did not, you don't need to study the national law of the country to work for, for a member unless uh, let's say the member is very uh, is in the committee um, uh, in the legal committee and he really specifically wants that his assistants have studied national law but uh, in my case this is not necessary but the link is important in terms of an understanding the processes in the country and especially because if you are uh, working for a member the member is um, representing a party in the um, uh, home country country so you definitely need to be able to follow the processes what is happening with this party whether the party is in government or not because um, in the end of the day um, uh, uh, this um, uh, party belongs to the uh, bigger uh, well, uh, po uh, European political party that is uh, in the European Parliament for example I'm working for the EPP which is a uh, center-right uh, party and currently the biggest one here with the, I mean, with the highest number of, uh, of politicians. Um, so uh, it is it is important to 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 be aware of, of um, what is happening in, in your country and uh, to be able also to help um, citizens. And uh, often we have complaints from different citizens, and we have to uh, take care of what has happened with them. And that in this case, the nationality matters definitely. And uh, I think um, the members prefer that their um, team uh, also understands the process in the country because during the week they're here, but usually in the weekend they're coming home to the countries and they're visiting their electorate and they're visiting uh, different sites of the country and presenting their work. So in order also to prepare them for the events that are happening on a national scale, it's important to, to, to be understanding of it. You can have a different nationality, but you can, for example, have lived in Germany for 10 years or have um, studied in a country for many years. And uh, this is also a link. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. And when it comes to, um, 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 I mean, I, I think you, this this question uh, uh, is, uh, of course, uh, um, more or less uh, topical with, because of the the COVID pandemic. You mentioned it as well during the during the, the this discussion. Um, but I saw that you um, uh, you were promoted at the start of uh, the. COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, I, I believe, and I was wondering what kind of um, effects it had on your on your work um, and if it still has an impact today. Um, well, it was quite difficult because actually my first month of uh, work as, uh, as an actual uh, advisor for my member um, after the traineeship was the first month of COVID. So when I signed my contract, I was at home and it was difficult because, um, um, you know, everything was online and you had to follow completely everyone. I mean, all of you, everyone understands that it was totally different and you had to follow everything online, every meeting, every preparation. And uh, in the beginning, I was very excited when I came here and I was lucky that there were events and I met many people. But then when I actually became uh, a real part of the team, um, there was the pandemic. So it was a bit disappointing, of course, but um, in the end of the day, now everything is uh, going back to normal. And uh, I believe that this was the case for absolutely everyone. And uh, I was lucky that I was offered um, this position. So uh, I, I don't want to complain. It was difficult, but uh, <laughs> it was uh, manageable. 
and uh, now it's a lot better. All right. Well, good. Glad to hear that it's uh, that it's much better. But do you still do you see a small difference um, uh, between two days tasks and perhaps the one in the past? I mean, I guess that also students can uh, uh, rely on this in the sense that uh, it seems like um, uh, we tend to do more events on. Well, now is a good example. <laughs> more events online, and is there a, yeah is there a, a small change between uh, before and after the the pandemic also at the, the European Parliament? I mean, there are changes, yes. Uh, there are um, some ideas to make uh, the possibility to have uh, online meetings in committees or online participation more permanent or voting, online voting for the members more permanent, especially for the ones who, let's say, are on a maternity leave or a, a paternity leave or they have a, a, a sickness or an emergency case situation. So you can see that there is a change that in people's minds they try to, to introduce a more flexible or hybrid uh, solutions. And a lot of the processes are still hybrid. So you can participate in a meeting online, but you can also be in person. I would say that in the last months, the parliament is really full and uh, there are a lot of people and they started organizing events. Events are allowed, visitor groups are allowed. So um, um, there is a really big change from, from COVID times, but um, indeed the possibility to have uh, some um, things hybrid um, is not left out, not yet. And even if the members prefer to have everything in person, I think that uh, um, uh, some things will remain hybrid forever, <laughs> according, to, according to me, at least. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any extra questions uh, from the audience? Um, yes, actually, I had another question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, um, but uh, you mentioned as well before that the Parliament and the European institutions give uh, certain courses uh, on not only languages, but culture and understanding laws, etc. Um, might be a strange question, but are there any uh, such educational courses or uh, resources available for non-employees of the European Union yet? I don't think so. Um, I mean, for, for non-employees coming from the from the institution itself, I don't think so. I, I believe that uh, you can have, uh, you can follow events, you can follow webinars, but um, specific courses or uh, trainings, um, no, I was just mentioning the ones that are organized for the employees, for example, just that if someone is worried they don't speak French well, or if someone wants to improve their networking skills or their research skills, uh, but for, for non-employees, I, I don't think so. I haven't come across anything like this uh, so far. All right, yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Just had to ask. I know that the uh, research, the Parliamentary Research Services does have a lot of uh, outreach um, for information. And uh, well, I have a few other leaflets. Uh, I, they are webinars, exactly. They're webinars, but um, uh, I don't think they're like navigated courses for, for non-workers, for sure. Yeah, fair, thank you. And hopefully when uh, we get to the European institutions, we can make use of those courses as well. <laughs> uh, yes, um, I mean, if any of you is ever coming here, you can feel free to, to give me a text or to contact me and uh, I can give you a little tour <laughs> if you would like. But I, I need to say that I didn't uh, um, say it in the beginning, but I really in uh, five, 10 minutes would need to, to, to go back to work. So. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes, of, of course, um, I, I think that if there are no other questions, we um, uh, I, I'm guessing that uh, we can uh, um, we can uh, we can give the floor to uh, to the to our next speakers. Um, so if there are no other questions, I would like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for uh, your answers. It was um, really really interesting and really uh, good to know more about uh, your your task at the at the European Parliament and better understand how it works from uh, from inside the institution. Um, so yeah, a thousand thanks for, uh, for for being here with us. It was greatly appreciated. Thank you as well, and uh, for all the questions for inviting me. And good luck with the rest of the day.
<laughs> Thank you. I would now like to give uh, back the floor then to my colleague uh, Galina Kochukovic, perhaps, um, if you would like to introduce our next speaker. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, we now move to the uh, speaker, the next speaker we have today. This is um, uh, Ms. Vesela Stoilova. And actually, only a couple, a couple of years ago, she was my thesis supervisee. Um, actually, one of the first I <laughs> supervised here in The Hague. And then after that, uh, she uh, decided to proceed with her career in sports law. Uh, and uh, now she actually works with uh, sports governing uh, bodies with the rules and regulations. And uh, she will be, of course, very happy to share with you her experience. So um, I would like to give the, the floor to uh, Ms. Stoilova. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, first of all, for inviting me, for getting in touch with me. I have great memories from The Hague University and, and from especially from our last year when we met. Too bad that we met so late, but still I had a lovely experience with the thesis and you were very helpful. Um, as for my experience, I guess I will go over my background. As most of you will know, I have been a student at The Hague University. I graduated in 2020. And throughout my studies there in year three, I chose to specialize in EU law. I like the technicality of it. I liked that it was very much structured, that I could follow a certain structure in order to resolve an issue. And then I had to write my thesis. So obviously, like most students do, I, I sat down, I started researching different topics. I had to figure out the, in which field to focus because I very much like competition law, but I also like sports law a lot. And that's what led me to figure out that I could write a thesis on um, financial fair play regulations of UEFA and how they coincide with EU law and more precisely competition law, which often comes into play in sports law because even though sports law is in itself practically separate from most of the international regulations, it is still very much intertwined and we always have to keep that in mind. And um, after writing this thesis, I decided to pursue a master's degree in international sports law here in Madrid. I graduated and I'm now working for a sports law firm for a legal boutique. And I'm also working as an external consultant for FIFA. But in my day-to-day -day tasks, EU law is still present, even though to a lesser extent, but it's always there in the back of the mind because we work a lot with national member associations, which are the federations of different countries. And we often help them establish their own regulations at a national level within the Federation. And of course, when doing that, they have to bear in mind the national laws, which in turn have to comply with EU laws. So it's all a bit of a pyramid structure that goes down and EU law is always there present. But I, I am happy to answer any questions that you may have or go more in depth into a topic that, that is of particular interest to the students. So let me know what you would like to hear more. Thank you very much um, for this uh, yeah, introduction and a bit of explanation what you're doing and one, why you like EU law. I am pretty sure that also students who are there can relate um, to the interest. Um, I would perhaps start a little bit the discussion and then uh, we will of course gather um, questions from the students. Um, my first question would be uh, perhaps also about um, yeah, a bit more about your studies here at TUAS and uh, later in uh, your master program and now uh, in your uh, early stages of um, a career as a legal professional. Uh, when you look back at your time at TUAS, what um, do you now use the most? Which skills and what knowledge you um, yeah, really need right now in, in your current position? Well, looking back, I will start from there, looking back at what I studied, I have definitely what we studied, the subjects that we covered in the elective courses that, that I chose in year three, helped me a lot to have a base layer of knowledge that I now apply in different aspects of sports law, whether this is labor law regulations, whether it is trade law as well, 
copyright and intellectual property. More precisely, I would say the fundamentals that on a daily basis are really there are the fundamental rights that come from European law, you know, freedom of movement as well is very important in sports law and in, in particular in, in football, the, um, the freedom to play football, let's say, wherever you'd like, the freedom to be employed, wherever you would want to and to move across Europe. And um, skills wise, all practical skills, anything from legal writing, that is there every day to representing clients, which involves also speaking in front of panels of different arbitrators, communicating with clients, with member associations, and being able to explain to them in a simple way, that is also in writing, being able to explain to them in a simple way, complicated regulations that maybe people with not, that don't have a legal background don't understand. So this is definitely a very valuable skill, being able to express the technicalities of EU law and then intertwine with sports law to people that don't have that legal background. But, um, and overall, again, to go back to the beginning of your question, my, my time at TUAS was, um, it was great. It was difficult in year one, but then I, I realized that it's not that difficult if you sit down and put in the time, you read and you make sure that you ask the questions, of course, because I, even now when I look back onto the, the first or second year of university, there's so many questions that I could have asked that would have saved me a lot of time now <laughs> for figuring out things, but it is the process. And um, I think it's important to, to engage as well with your colleagues because there's people that have incredible background, whether legal or not, and that can always be helpful in the future. And building that network is essential, and especially in sports law as well, that is very much key. I still keep in touch with um, people that have studied it to us that are also maybe in Spain or somewhat involved in the industry that is a bit closer to sports law, and that's great. Right. Great, uh, thank you very much for this. Uh answer and um, now I would like to give the floor to the students uh, perhaps um, you have some questions some something you want to know want to ask please go ahead hi yes I, I have a, a couple of questions actually um, very interesting your career path and I'm, I'm honestly so um, I'm, I'm amazed. Um, uh, we did actually, well, with uh, Ms. Plasajo, um, the Mood Tour competition this year, and it was actually on uh, sports law and competition law. Um, so I'm actually amazed uh, because uh, I wanted to ask you actually the question, how do you find working in, in that field, uh, considering that it's not, um, not really regulated, not that many laws? It's so, I mean, for me, it was... Uh, it was mind blowing to try and figure something out if there's no much to take. So I wanted to ask you about that. How, how do you, how do you manage that? How do you work with that? It's, it's very easy as, as soon as, and as long as you like it, it's great. The thing is, while some people argue, oh no, like Sportiva does, it does not exist. It's uh, something there. There's no such thing as autonomy. It is very much autonomous, but the thing is you can't, I think at least that you can't really go into sports law without having the base of law in general. And honestly, it is a great experience because you meet people from all across the world, literally all across the world, that can bring that different type of knowledge to you, to your table. And then that of course helps you in turn. And sports law, you know, it's growing. It has grown a lot and it keeps on growing more and more because there's issues that are challenging also at a national level where the, um, the governing bodies of a certain country themselves, they have to figure out how to regulate that. For example, in, uh, in a lot of countries, if you have a player that has a contract with a club and then they have a dispute, the player can't just simply go into international arbitration, which would be the international court, uh, the, the court for arbitration for sports. In some countries that player is obliged to go to the national labor courts and oftentimes the national labor courts they have no specialization whatsoever into sports law or very very minimal because in in itself it's not very much regulated at national level the regulations or the, the rules that may come from the ministry of sport let's say 
focus more on developing youth academies, focus more on youth in sports and amateur sport, more promotional activities, let's say like that, and then of course budgeting and finance. But then that's the challenge that national lawyers are faced with, and that's why it's important to develop the knowledge for each country so that you have a pool of specialized lawyers that can deal with these issues because although a dispute between a club and a player may be a labor dispute, the specifics of sport will always come into play. For example, the specifics of when can you terminate a contract? Maybe in, in employment law in, in, a, in a given company, you could terminate your contract by giving notice for in the, giving notice and then having to stay at the company for one or two months, let's say. Whereas a player would not necessarily want to do that by any chance. They would have to give notice and give the club 15 days to comply with its obligations that it may have breached. But then if you try to pressure a player to stay into the club, you're essentially restricting his freedom. So that these are issues that, again, intertwine with the EU law and national law a lot. But it's, it's, a, it's a great field to work in. People are very open. They're very welcoming. They're always happy to learn more and more from people from different countries. And the networking is, is fundamental, absolutely fundamental, but it is the best thing that you can get out of it. But thank you for your question. It's a great one. I'm glad that, did you like the mood? Um, well, <laughs> it was really, really confusing. <laughs> like really? I, I enjoyed it very much, but I had um, pretty much no prior experience with competition law. Um, so I was faced with uh, sports <laughs> and basically three cases that we refer to mainly um, the Bosman case. <laughs> um, and that was about it. We had um, all very, very far stretches to be like, oh, this case kind of applies to this. Yeah. Case. Analogy. <laughs> so that's why I was like very curious, like how, how? <laughs> With sports and in competition, because they're both, the thing is, while sports law is a bit more, you could say that it's a bit more abstract. Competition law is very technical. It's like, okay, you have Article 101, 102, then you go into mergers and so on, but it's very much structured. Whereas in sports law, it's a lot very very much on a case by case by case by case basis and even though you may have two cases with the same fact uh, fact pattern one element can change everything for example the nationality of an athlete can change everything the the age of, a, of that athlete can change everything the country where you're based where the case is based can change everything so there is a bit less structure in there but of course regulations of sports governing bodies help and they uh, usually try to cooperate a lot with the eu institutions on different projects so there's always a close link for example there's um there's projects on fans that participate in sport governance there's projects of course on the development of uh, sport in the youth years of, um, of children so that's great and it's, it's good that the european commission is also very much involved in sports Thank you for the question again. I don't know if anybody else has any questions. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Astrid, and um, uh, for, for the question and Rosella, of course, for the uh, answer. Um, indeed, uh, yes, this, this, this moot court uh, this uh, year was, uh, yeah, indeed, very, very much um, in the topic, um, yeah, this interrelation between sports law and competition, so <laughs> something that, um, yeah, very fascinating, of course. Um, I, um, let's, let's also see whether other students have questions a bit later, but I uh, perhaps would, would just jump in and ask uh, you to elaborate a little bit more about your yeah, everyday tasks. So what do you actually do in your current position and yeah, how your tasks look like and um, yeah. Well, um, because I am currently, so to say, working in, in two different, um, lines let's say of, uh, of the profession on one side within the uh, law firm my day-to-day -day tasks revolve around advising of course clients which starts with a lot of research <laughs> and getting to know their case this could go from uh, having a player that hasn't been paid his salaries on time and how to proceed of course it's not always directly going and suing the club because sometimes this is time consuming and expensive. So we try to first contact the club in an amicable manner, trying to resolve the, the dispute in an amicable manner so that all parties are satisfied and happy with the outcome. 
then of course, if not, we would submit a claim to uh, FIFA, then that would move on to uh, CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, if needed. And um, then on the other side, my tasks for FIFA, they revolve a lot with, on working with um, member associations, with the federations of different countries, as they work in the professional football department, where we try to help member associations develop more and professionalize football. Professionalize football not only on the pitch itself, actually mostly outside the pitch because professionalizing it on the pitch is the job of the clubs and the coaches but for example we help them set up their own national dispute resolution cha chambers in order to have a more centralized approach where disputes are resolved within the member association and like that it is faster because FIFA is overloaded with cases so um, we help them set, set that up we clarify questions on changes in regulations because well, regulations are written in a very simple, plain English, as we say. There are a lot of a lot of times where questions arise that maybe, but wait, what is the definition of that? What does that actually mean? Because in, everything needs specifications in order to ensure that clubs and, and associations are complying with that. And uh, as as a big part of my day to day tasks as well is to attend events, whether these would be different lectures, whether it would be a seminar, a discussion on a different topic, different congresses. And uh, that's where I get the face to face talk the most. Now, after COVID has, so to say, calmed down, we have more events that are in person. And this is always great to exchange experience with um, colleagues to also build connections. And uh, then we, we may even end up having, for example, on a day, a group of people that are on three different continents trying to find a good, suitable time to work together in a case that is located on different, a completely different continent. So it's very much international. And um, it is hard, but with good time management, you could do everything. Thank you so much. Yes, that sounds really very interesting and very diverse uh, in terms of tasks and interactions and uh, yeah, different assignments that you face. Um, I would like to uh, just check whether we have perhaps any questions from the students. Um, of course, you can raise your hand uh, if you have a question right in the chat, but perhaps even yeah, better just asking. By raising that's your hand. A question. Um, Alessandra, I think, is uh, raising her hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, my question relates to so the kind of division of your two, I wouldn't get jobs, if I can say that. So how does that work? Do you work full time for that law firm? And then on the side, you do uh, advising for FIFA or how does it work? Yeah, essentially it works like that. But the nice thing about working in sports law is that that's of course not for every law firm, not for every company. It's not that you would have to fill in a nine to six time. Is that you would prioritize the tasks based on the urgency. Of course, if we have a client, then his or her case is uh, with an expiring time limit because oftentimes we have a time limit of 20 days to submit a claim. We would focus on that claim. Whereas on the other hand, if we have a project with a member association of FIFA that is trying to um, set up their national dispute resolution chamber within the federation, this is a project that often takes a lot of time, so it won't be on the urgent list. And essentially, I divide my time depending on the urgency of the task. I have had times where I had to do two things at the same time, and it was my brain was getting fried, <laughs> basically. But that's pretty much it. Urgency and prioritizing those tasks that are urgent. But the thing is, everybody is very understanding in the in the field. So for example, if I have an urgent task for my boss at FIFA, my boss at the law firm would obviously understand she's also a, an external consultant with FIFA. So we pretty much work all together. But I hope I answered the, your question. Yes, you did, thank you. I see a question here from Nina. Maybe a silly question, but is there a lot of traveling involving a career like you have since it is very international industry? Yes, there is a lot of traveling. Um, of course, now with COVID, a lot of things can be done online as well. But there is a lot of traveling, but that's the nice thing about it. Because times when you travel, you don't feel the pressure of oh, I'm traveling for work or something because you're oftentimes happy to see the people that you're going to see. 
But um, across Europe, there's more travel. A bit outside Europe to, let's say, Latin America, there is usually more travel, but it is not on the top list. Like, it's not prioritized, that type of travel, because obviously it's very long distance. And oftentimes the travel would be for one or two days for something quick. But um, I would say, yes, there is a lot of travel. No worries, you're welcome. Right. Um, yes, indeed. It's uh, also like international careers, of course, <laughs> are linked to travels. That's that's indeed um, often the case. And it's nice if indeed you enjoy it as well. Um, I would like to perhaps, um, yeah, I'll ask a question I think for, for many students will be interesting because you yourself, you are uh, graduated recently uh, from your master's program. Um, and of course, um, yeah, so you started the job and you definitely have some challenges um, at the very beginning, uh, perhaps. And um, what would be your, yeah, perhaps like to, to share with your experience, what particular challenges you encountered and to give a bit of advice to students how to deal with um, yeah, those challenges at the beginning of their career? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. The, um, the thing is, I did the, my master's in Madrid in Spain and the master's was in English with a lot of international people as well. And um, of course, I wanted to stay in Spain. I did not want to move again because I had just moved from the Netherlands. I wanted to solidify my Spanish, learn it better, of course, by practicing it, by speaking every day. So definitely one challenge that came up was um, the reluctancy of Spanish law firms to employ international students or international lawyers, let's say, because they were thinking, um, okay, this is not a person that has graduated in Spanish law, that is not a Spanish native speaker. But um, I got lucky because my employer, she actually said, um, I was looking specifically for an international person, not like no offense to Spanish people, but she wanted somebody that is international that spoke um, good English and that had, of course, connections also outside Spain. But the, that was the first challenge, the language barrier, so to say, and it wasn't even that much of a language barrier because in sports law, a lot of the times we just work in English or we work in several languages in, in order to understand ourselves. For example, in um, there could be cases where, because FIFA and CAST, they have a specific, they have certain official languages. So CAST, these are Spanish, French, and English. But let's say you have arbitrators that are Italian and the parties also speak Italian. They may agree to work on the case in Italian and to hear the case in Italian. So that was a bit of a challenge, but that is something that once you show people how good you are, that you're improving, that you're learning, they understand very easily. And another challenge in sports, though, I would say is um, getting, getting out there, getting recognized, getting... Um, the trust of people, people believing in you that you could do it, even though you have very little experience, because essentially most masters in sports law are very short. So you, the time in which you focus on theory is very limited and then you jump into practice immediately. But I believe that's the, that's the best way to learn, because the, once you repeat the theory enough times through practice, you learn it even more and you solidify that knowledge. But then it's important to understand how to apply it in a given case. So the challenge there was with getting out there, gaining the trust of people, that I can actually do it, that I, I, I am capable of doing it because everybody is very happy to see you. You're, you're studying sports law and, and that's great. It's good that you're putting yourself out there, uh, but then maybe they don't call you. <laughs> so that's one thing, but being confident is essential. It is crucial going out there, talking to people, even if, maybe you don't know a lot about a certain sport because we don't encounter only football. It's, it's not only football. I, for example, I recently had a case that was with ice skating or now I'm about to have a case with handball. Sports that I know barely anything about, <laughs> but it's nice because um, people welcome you with open arms once they see that you're willing to work, that you're happy to work on the case and they're generally happy to see young faces. So my advice would be to be confident to pursue your dream, so to say, or your current aspiration, your current goals, because maybe maybe it's not for everybody. I have had classmates that have decided to return to other fields of um, fields of law after following the master's course, so, but 
it's normal. It is always something that will open your eyes, that will open your mind. The people that you would meet will share great experiences with you. So take all of that in, appreciate it, and learn from it would generally be my advice, but be confident. It was a great question. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your response and for actually inspiring our students and for sharing also um, yeah, your, your advice and actually yeah, having this positive message to them. Um, I would like uh, before, yeah, before wrapping up fully, I just want to double check whether perhaps some students still have some questions they didn't uh, manage to ask yet. So if it's the case, please. Um, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, yes, I had another question actually. Um, thank you. Um, wanted to ask more, you mentioned that um, if you have a labor dispute, you, um, not you don't necessarily sue the club, but you um, first try to talk it amicably and you could also file a complaint to FIFA. I don't know if I understood that correctly, but I was actually very curious, what is the involvement of, uh, of FIFA internationally since we will just discuss that it's not very regulated and I mean, FIFA is kind of a monopoly in a certain way. Uh, so what is their tasks and how involved is FIFA? In dispute resolution specifically, or um, no, in, in 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 sports, yeah, like how how much of an executive or de or decision power do they have when it comes to specific situations or regulation? Like how much can FIFA actually affect uh, people's or, or players' lives? Okay, I will start with two words: a lot. <laughs> Let's put it out there. Um, FIFA, as, as you know, is, is the main sports governing body of football. So the one that is on the top. Under FIFA, you have different confederations like UEFA, the European one, CONCACAF, and so on. What FIFA does on a daily basis is, of course, divided in numerous departments. And one of the departments, for example, is litigation. In the litigation department, they get, I don't know how many claims per day, but they are drowning claims from players against clubs, because maybe the club hasn't paid the salaries to the player for more than two months. And that's what allows the player to ask to terminate the contract. And then the player goes obviously to FIFA to ask for compensation before it's dispute resolution bodies. FIFA has now has created a football tribunal that also has an agent's chamber that will resolve disputes between agents, clubs, and players. Because for example, agents is an area that was not too regulated by FIFA. They were regulated, then they re deregulated them a bit, and now they want to go back and regulate agents a bit because there's a lot of money involved in the agent profession. And unfortunately, it's a lot of money that goes to them instead of the player, the one that is actually doing the hard labor. But going back a bit to your question, how is FIFA involved? FIFA produces the regulations that are binding at national level. They have, for example, the regulations on the transfer status of players. These are the regulations that would govern at what age can a club register players, of course, because you have minors as well that are very talented. For how long can you register a player at your club? For how long can they sign a contract? Because, of course, you cannot sign a contract with a 15-year-old player for 10 years. This would be abusive. It regulates also the terms under which such a contract can be terminated in order to, again, protect contractual stability. Essentially, for example, there's this protected period, which is usually one year, during which you cannot terminate the contract of a player. But why is this in order to maintain his employment? Because these players, they, they live from, from that. Their job is their hobby as well, but they have to make enough money in order to live from that. Because in not, not all of the clubs are paying crazy salaries to players like, let's say, um, a PSG in, in France is to Neymar. So the FIFA is there to step in and say, okay, you can only terminate the contract in this, this and that situation in order to protect the contractual stability, to protect the employment of the players, to protect, of course, the integrity of the competitions. FIFA is also involved in a lot of match fixing activities. For example, they work with a company that is called Sports Raider, which essentially has a software that follows all of the games in Europe and all championships. And once it detects suspicious betting, suspicious, suspicious betting actions and activities, suspicious results, it would create a report that is then sent to UEFA. FIFA also may get involved. Um, they're there to stop 
such activities much uh, fixing betting um, also bribery and so on it was involved a lot in the dispute resolution like i mentioned because before a case goes to the court of arbitration for sport in switzerland it will 99.9 percent .9 have to go first to fifa and um, they have become very efficient and very fast in resolving cases because back in the days they were overloaded with cases when i say back in the days i mean about seven years ago they were overloaded with cases not enough people to deal with the cases and it, the whole process was very slow and it could take up to more than a year to resolve a dispute whereas now a dispute could be resolved in in three months and um yeah that's pretty much it i think i don't know if I, maybe maybe if something wasn't clear you you can ask me again to focus in depth on something else Oh, oh no, it was all perfectly clear. Sorry, I was taking notes like very, very fast. It is so interesting. And I already I already know that my boyfriend is going to enjoy this very much. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a great talk. The, the nice thing about sports law is that if you're a sports fan, the, the thing there is that people have to watch out going into studying sports law more as fans. Because then there may be a bit of a delusion because it's not just being a fan. Sports law is not about being a fan of a certain football team or uh, liking to watch the Olympics, let's say. There's other issues and you see, you don't see only the one, the players that are at the top in the best clubs with the highest salaries have their life resolved. You see the, the young players that are 18 that are trying to make a career in sports where you also have to explain to them the harsh reality that sport is only up until a certain age and after they have to do something with their, their life. This is also another place where FIFA and UEFA play a very important role because they have a lot of programs that are for former players, let's say, or even current players, whether these are in, in club management, in football law, in general governance skills. Basically, FIFA is trying to be and is, I think, the parent, the big parent of football, of member associations, of the clubs, of players, and is always there to help them and uh, help them move forward, whether purely from a sports perspective and also legally in, in, from a governance perspective. All right, perfect. That was perfectly clear. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you very much. And it's great to see actually that the interest in this area of law has sparked. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rosella, for uh, sharing your experience, your knowledge, and actually indeed encouraging uh, students to look in different areas of EU law because, you know, EU law, it's really uh, and, and international law, of course, here. With, uh, with links to, to international sports law, of course, as well. But there are so many dimensions and so many different options uh, where to go, where to specialize. And I think that it was really um, helping to broad also their horizons. Yeah. Um, and I have just one last time, just want to ask perhaps someone else wants to have a final question, if something else, uh, came to your mind, you still want to ask Mr. Ilova? Yeah, I don't see anything. So, um, yes, yeah, so I would like to thank you very much for your time today, for joining us um, in this panel. And I personally want to say that, well, it was really nice to see you today. We haven't seen each other for, for a bit, uh, but I enjoyed working with you as um, my student, the Jesus supervisee. And for me, it is so great to see when actually our students succeed, build the careers, pursue their dreams, and can yeah, realize uh, all their um, career ideas um, in their lives. It's really heartwarming and I'm so uh, glad that, uh, well, now you join us you know, as a professional and share your experience with the students uh, of course. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for getting in touch with me. Um, it's great speaking to people about sports law because it's not that well known. I suppose there's still the sports law course into a senior three, right? 
Somebody still teaches it, right? <laughs> We changed, we changed the curriculum a little bit, but uh, well, there are parts uh, in, the, in the module. We now have a system of modules, uh, basically, and well, we don't have the specific courses as such, but it still makes part of, uh, of a bigger module, yes. Okay, that's great. That, it, it's great to see people that are interested, especially ladies as well, because there's not that many ladies, but they are ladies and they're powerful. They're in positions of charge. They're great. And um, I, I hope uh, I have inspired people to take a look into sports though, maybe, maybe pursue a career in the future. And if, if any of the students have any doubts or questions for me, you can add me on, on LinkedIn, at the Celestilova, and you can ask me any questions you may have. I'm always happy to help in any way I can. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank, thank you very much for, for speaking today and uh, well we appreciate <laughs> and indeed many see many comments about very empowering and very interesting so yes um, we have a very good also feedback from the students so uh, i think that then at this point we can wrap up our event we had uh, actually um, very interesting speakers and i am um, sure that our students learned a lot and got many ideas how um, they can proceed further and it is also great to hear that our alumni are doing so great and also want to help the current students so and invite to connect to talk to ask questions in case you are interested so um, please also I'm uh, talking to, to the students don't don't hesitate networking is important and actually we call this event employment networking event so well use this opportunity get in touch with our alumni because they have very uh, interesting and rich careers and you can always um, get more information um, as well so use this opportunity and we will of course uh, see um, each other somewhere at KUAS at some point. And uh, I also invite you to join other panels that are taking place today to also uh, learn a bit uh, more about other areas um, of law uh, and uh, get even more inspiration. Um, and last but not least, I would like to thank my co-moderator, Ms. Lassero. Um, it's always a pleasure we are moderating the sessions for a couple of years already um, and um, well we hope to see um, many of you also next year we will have another edition of careers in the new law uh, and uh, well good luck with with everything that you have Thank you again. Big thank for um, thank you for the for the guest speakers, for the audience, for my um, great colleagues, um, great colleague, and for uh, the assistance of Astrid, who was really really helpful uh, as well. So have a wonderful day, and um, we we will yeah see each other really soon uh, in person or online. Yeah, yes, Astrid. Yes, many thanks. Your help was invaluable, and thanks for joining us on the short notice and yeah we really appreciate that of course always happy to help and thank you for organizing this is very very interesting i loved it thank you bye bye hi everyone